I did not have sexual relations for that one. Well, I'm not I earned everything I got. Go! 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 Change will not come because we wait for some other person. Hey, Political Radar audience, welcome to another riveting episode of Blind Partisan Podcast. Blind Partisan Show, I got yelled at last time, actually, right? It's supposed to be show, because it's all about the YouTube. I, I, I don't know if I buy that, but hey, YouTube, uh, I, I, I recommend audio only. I have a face for radio. So, uh, I am here with uh, Jeff Rumbaugh. That's right. Did I say that correctly? You are. Okay. I, you know, I, I really want to, I want to strive to get people's names correctly <laughs> at the very least. Uh, so you are, uh, I, it says care for real. So for real, you're running for governor. Yeah. That's my, uh, that's my campaign slogan. Of Wisconsin. Yes. Okay. Uh, I would hope so. I okay. think I've been touring around Wisconsin. Okay. okay. Uh, but that's my slogan. I've been caring for adults and adolescents with uh, a wide variety of disabilities. And uh, that's where I've built my campaign on is about caring. And in today's world, uh, fake seems to be a common thread, whereas this is the real thing. Okay. So um, what would be what, what would be an example of something that you would bring that would be real that uh, yeah another candidate would not have? Well, well as far as uh, my experience goes, it may be a little unorthodox. Um, I'm not a sitting politician or an attorney, but uh, like I said, I've cared for people in very intimate ways for a long time, working with physicians, law enforcement, um, residential services, uh, parents, guardians, teams of people around Dane County. And I see Wisconsin as a larger version of that, and I'm ready to bring that. A larger version of Dane County? Of what I do in Dane County. Oh, okay. Is, uh, uh, those, those kind of cares, that kind of attitude, those kind of lenses that I wear. Yeah. Is so what's your background? I can bring. Uh, <clears throat> I graduated from Northern Illinois University uh, in 95 with a degree in history. And it was kind of specializing in African-American history. And then I moved up to Madison. I, uh, I started working with people with special needs. And then I decided to go to Edgewood College in Madison, where I got my teaching certificate in special education. And since then, I've been uh, working hard in the field of uh, developmental disabilities. So that's, uh, that's been my background for almost two decades now. Uh, so... Uh, what ins what inspired you to want to run for governor? Did you do you see things in your background that you're seeing as a, a major need that we have? Good question. Indeed, yes, I do. I mean, I I feel that uh, the people aren't being cared for. I feel that the uh, politics is drifting further and further away from uh, the needs of the people um, into the arms of the few. And I feel that I represent um, the people more so than a lot of the other candidates. Um, that motivated me. And I also am... Uh, In what way? Well, <clears throat> there's, there's things that are happening, um, uh, like fresh water, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, are we seeing the care uh, that needs to go into that uh, to keep people healthy, to keep our society together? And that's something everyone needs. And we're not seeing the kind of attention that needs to be paid to our drinking water. And to me, that's an example of, are we really representing the people? Or are we representing corporate needs or you know, uh, other things outside of uh, Wisconsin, Wisconsinites, the Badger State? So is there a problem with our drinking water? Uh, there is. There's, uh, there's lead reported in Milwaukee. Um, there's also uh, fecal contamination in some parts of Wisconsin from humans and uh, cattle, but um, we're seeing problems with wells. I was recently in Grant County 
uh, for a meeting, uh, uh, sanitation, zoning, um, and there were some geologists there uh, talking about wells and where leakage is coming from and uh, disturbances in the freshwater supply. So in some of the more rural areas, uh, the farming and the manure are affecting our freshwater. And then in urban areas like Milwaukee, we're looking at issues with lead, uh, which is the number one environmental hazard to children. So these are some issues that you know truly represent the people. Um, but the lead problems usually get taken care of, don't they? Well, they're not being uh, addressed properly. There's been funding cut recently um, for projects that are happening under uh, Tom Barrett. And in situations like that, uh, I don't think we should be backing out. I think there should be more of an intense focus on things like that. So, Okay. Um, so you're, uh, I, I don't want to uh, belabor the uh, care for real thing, but uh, do you have other examples of care issues that are, you think, lacking? Uh, you mentioned water. Yeah. Well, there's also um, food is... Yes, it's a broad term, but what we're looking at is uh, the rusty-patched bumblebee uh, is on the uh, endangered species list. And that is an insect that uh, is responsible for pollinating so many of the crops and plants that humans need. And if that uh, bee continues to dissipate, I mean, it's very rare right now. And without those kind of pollinators, uh, the price of food is going to keep rising and keep rising. Okay. And, you know, we all need food, and we have to be very careful. And that's, uh, in a broad sense, that's also me caring for Wisconsinites. So as governor, what can you do about that? Well, there's uh, various things. What we're looking at as far as the uh, rusty-patched bumblebee goes is uh, we're looking at the use of certain types of pesticides that are uh, the main cause for their, uh, for their disappearance and what we call the colony collapse disorder. And the main type of pesticides are called neonicotinoids, and they're actually based off uh, the drug nicotine, the chemical structure. And they're a neurotoxin to these bees. And so we need to work on getting that kind of uh, chemical uh, out of agriculture because that's, uh, you know, the pros and cons there uh, are, uh, are such a way that food for humans is uh, a little more important than uh, this type of pesticide. Okay, so in a, in a, a state that, uh, let's just say 50% voted for Trump, how do you feel that you're going to convince them that nicotinoids... <laughs> which, Close I'm, enough. which I'm sure I said wrong, and, and I think that's my point. Uh, how are you going to convince people that that's an important enough issue to change? Good point. I mean, the, uh, you know, that kind of topic could easily, easily be you know, dismissed as, you know, oh, you're you know, some kind of tree hugger, you know, some kind of granola uh, type of uh, you know, approach, but... The, the way to help bring Wisconsin on board with this issue, uh, especially the GOP vote, is to, like I said, the, the, the food, perhaps they're not necessarily concerned about the actual pollination process, but this is talking about the, their wallet. Um, this is talking about all of our wallets. Food is going to cost more money, and that affects everyone. So. If individuals see that their pocketbook is emptying, um, they want to see a solution. Um, okay, I'm going to push back a little bit on that. So do you, do you really think that people have enough foresight to, to be, you know, three steps ahead of, of an, what, what the actual end problem is? I mean, most people have credit card debt. Most people, you know, not most, but many people don't have health insurance. Uh, people... Uh, have a hard time uh, recognizing the investment that they should make of their own in education, things like that. Mm -hmm. So how do, you, how do you make a case like that to people? 
That's a good point. I mean, I I want to uh, – one of the things our campaign is interested in uh, is – public education uh, curriculum reform. And this goes back a little uh, further than I think what you're talking about. But as far as curriculum reform, uh, things like this, uh, you know, pollination, for example, need to be introduced to our youth. It's such a critical element of our existence. And if we start educating our youth in topics like pollination as they get older, uh, integrating that kind of uh, strategy and philosophy won't seem as foreign. Um, but I do see what you're saying. I mean, it's right away, how do we look at that foresight? And it's, you know, it's the same with our water supply. We're running out of water. How do we convince individuals? And I think uh, knowledge is power. I think it's going to take uh, a widespread um, sharing of knowledge and uh, getting the farmers on board with us. Um, they're a prominent, uh, you know, respected source around Wisconsin. And if the farmers jump on board with us, I think that we'll find more, uh, more of an open-armed uh, feel from some of the residents around the state. So, so you mentioned education. Um, so uh, I guess that's that's a huge question. We could probably spend hours yeah. talking alone about that. Uh, so just uh, uh, briefly, in Green Bay, we had... Um, I don't know. It might have been blown out of proportion by some people, but we had uh, we have issues with Washington Middle School, um, where we had a teacher resign because she said that the conditions are violent, and there's been kind of a, a renewed interest in uh, by uh, by by some people anyway, not not enough by our our school board maybe uh, to uh, do something to improve what we're perceiving as our inner city schools. Green Bay's tiny, but, uh, you know, we refer to that as an inner city school now. Uh, so what what do you think you could do on a state level for governor to, you know, help our, our, our troubled schools? Are you referring to the, the safety element? I mean, so I, f- I feel like there... I, I, I feel like there's many components to that, but sure. yeah, let's let's touch on safety. What do you think we could do about safety? You know, we did just have the shooting in Florida. Uh-huh. What do you, where do you go on that? Yeah, that's uh, that's a subject where I I feel uh, we talked about it, uh, that at a debate recently uh, in Kenosha, and I feel that uh, you know it's like President Obama said about healthcare. There's no silver bullet for healthcare reform. And no pun intended, but I, I think it's foolish to go into uh, this race actually believing that uh, once elected, you're going to be able to ban you know, everything. Mm-hmm. And that's not realistic. It's a big state, and there's a lot of uh, sane gun owners out there, um, you know, and not just hunters. Our approach is something we call agree on three. And it happens to make a kind of a handy uh, hashtag, Mm -hmm. but we're looking for, uh, you know, uh, a meeting of the minds where agree on three is a three-day waiting period. And the purpose of it is for both sides to acknowledge that there's a problem with safety. It's not taking your guns away, and it's not, uh, you know, both sides aren't getting what they want, but it's just an acknowledgement of the safety issue. It's a baby step. And there's other things we're interested in doing too. Uh, We're interested in legislation, uh, statewide legislation, where gun gun shop owners have to go through a background check. And that way we're approaching the vendor versus the buyer. We're also looking to have statewide uh, legislation about gun vendors having to lock their uh, firearms up securely when the store isn't closed. And a couple of those at the end are minor points, but we're looking at baby steps towards helping uh, make society safer, including schools. So I don't own a gun. I've never owned a gun. Um, Kids can't buy guns, can they? Well, <clears throat> the individual in Florida was 19, and he was able to purchase okay. the AR-10. And it seems kind of uh, odd that you can, you know, purchase that kind of weapon, but not purchase alcohol. You know, it seems like one is a little more uh, dangerous. 
I don't know. I think you'd. I think you'd. Uh, uh, I think you could make a case that uh, there are more deaths caused by alcohol, actually. Indeed. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but um, so so kind of on the education front, though. Um, so in terms of a middle school, uh, there weren't guns there. I mean, maybe there was one gun or something over the course of several years, but um, but by and large, it's more of a like. Um, I don't know. I've heard it referred to as chaos and um, just a lack of uh, uh, just organization in order to, you know, just the basic safety to provide education. You know, these kids feel just like there's there's chaos. They could be bullied. They could be, you know, uh, there's vandalism done to vehicles. And what do you think could be done about, like, just the basics, not even getting into, like, the, the fringe cases of, uh, you know, a 19 year old bringing a gun in, what do we do like day to day to improve education in our state? Well, I think, uh, I think we need to stand behind our teachers. Uh, I think that um, considering that uh, the courts, uh, especially in the Milwaukee area, are crowded with cases uh, where parents or guardians are uh, lawyering up and uh, Taking legal action against teachers due to, um, you know, grades that they perceived as being, you know, inaccurate or unfair. Um, there's also issues of discipline, and these teachers are getting pulled away from their, you know, potential instruction time and their ability to focus on um, the students, which is why they went into the field. You know, so that's telling our teachers, hey. You know, we have your back. I also believe that, um, you know, since I, I worked for the Madison Metropolitan School District, and when I started there, there wasn't any security. You know, there was somebody at the, in the front desk uh, area. There was a receptionist. Mm -hmm. But other than that, there really wasn't any type of security or, you know. Well, mostly the security problems are not people coming in through the front door anyway. Yeah. The problems are inside the school. Okay, so, so the security not, not, at the front door doesn't do anything for the day-to-day -day security. Problems. But the the security guard eventually a security guard was at every school, and now there there was two, and then there was a police officer there okay. every day. And I think um, not just somebody at the door, but going around the school and being you know around the students and helping to keep uh, you know bullying or fighting and things like that at bay. Um, uh, so you mentioned that that was done in Madison at the district level. So do you think that that's a state issue, or do you think that that's a local issue? Uh, actually, I think that's a local issue. I think that uh, crime rates vary across the state, obviously, and the need for that kind of service, uh, you know, most likely varies around uh, around the state. So I wouldn't want to enforce that statewide, but I think that's something the community can say, hey, we, you know, we're not feeling safe. Let's hire a security guard. And, you know, parents getting more involved, like in the PTA, that helps bridge some gaps, which may improve what you're talking about. Well, see, so the, uh, I have a, I have just, uh, I think people think I'm crazy, but the, uh, uh, you know, having the school on lockdown and having a security person at the front, I feel like we're, we're kind of saying parents are somewhat unwelcome. Mm -hmm. And uh, considering that, literally never in the history of our country has a has a, a parent gone in and gone on a mass shooting spree uh i feel like that's not needed the, the roaming halls with security guards i'm huge hugely in favor of that mm -hmm. you know have some have some uh you know big uh you know mean looking dudes i think that that i think <laughs> that that's uh you know especially in the middle school where where like they just need to feel that safety security you know um i think that's important so um uh do you think there is anything on the state level that we can do in terms of education? So, I mean, safety is one thing, of course, but like, what about education? People well, say that's important. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I mean, let's uh, let's talk about the UW system. I mean, that's if you talk statewide. That's something that a lot of our state is proud of, and we should be. That's a a, um, a, a learning bank, and it's spread across the state. I think that. Um, with rising tuition and uh, difficulty in retaining uh, staff, uh, our campaign believes that UW, uh, especially UW-Madison, should partner with businesses in Wisconsin. And 
UW can train uh, members of these businesses for you know related uh, tasks or duties that they would be performing, and uh, alternately, students could become engaged in internships with these businesses. And following that, businesses can reinvest in the university based on the fields of study that they're benefiting from the most. I mean, we need to keep students in Wisconsin. Um, you know, they go to our universities, and a lot of them are leaving the state. How do we keep them in? Well, so do you think that uh, we should be providing lower tuition for uh, things that we have a need for versus things that are more of a, you know, what if I want to be a... Uh, women's studies philosophy major, you know, where the, where there isn't a direct application to a job out there where uh, an insurance company isn't going to help fund it. Do you think we should have reduced it tuition? Uh, that's a good point. Yeah, there may be, <clears throat> excuse me, there may be uh, certain fields of study where we're not seeing a, a big grab for uh, staffing. I mean, there are fields like uh, nursing where there's a huge demand and we'll be, you know, uh, moving a lot of students around, hopefully, within the state. Uh, but some of these other programs, I mean, we're looking for, like, students, lower-income students who may not, you know, be able to afford the UW. We don't want them turned away, um, but we want to be able to offer them a sliding scale where they can get into the university based on their ability to pay. So, uh, you know, there's a... a well, and their test scores, though. Yeah, well, of course, they have to be qualified to get into the school. I mean, but don't we mostly, I mean, uh, my understanding is that just about anybody, we already have the, that's what the FAFSA is, right? They can get, they get uh, grants and no loans, yeah. loans, of course, uh, you know, through the student loan program. So isn't, isn't that, that's not adequate? No, I don't think, uh, I don't think we're reaching a broad enough uh, population. Um, I think, I think the diversity level um, is a little uh, off off the mark. I mean, we support affirmative action and, and programs where we're looking to increase integration. But I think to make sure that Your campaign or the state. Uh, well, our campaign okay. is, is uh, uh, you know believes in in those elements, and I think we need to make sure that we have a diverse population in our universities, and you know as many different uh, you know ways that we can approach that. I think would be a positive for Wisconsin. Uh, so full disclosure, I'm an adjunct instructor at UWGB. So uh, I, I have a certain amount of bias there. Um, but uh, so uh, I guess we, uh, we don't need to be, uh, go on on that either. So uh, another one of your, uh, I guess like your first major bullet point on your, on your campaign list on your website, uh, Jeff Rumbo for governor.com. Yes. Throw that out there. Mm -hmm. um, so that's uh, environment. So you touched on water. Uh, anything else to talk about on the water front or on the on the environment front at all? Yeah, uh, I think what we're looking at is uh, concerns with energy. Uh, there's, uh, you know, we need to move away from fossil fuels. Uh, we need to move away from uh, coal, natural gas. Um, we're looking at banning fracking. But uh, the storage of electricity is the big challenge right now. Um, we're able to generate electricity, but on days when there's, or you know, weeks where there's a lot of cloud cover, or we're seeing an extended period of you know little to no wind, um, those those green alternatives aren't able to provide the kind of energy that we need, and that's when the you know the coal and gas turbines kick in. So if we can find a way to store electricity um, within the state, I think that would be uh, a, a prime uh, investment. I mean, we're seeing things like that with Tesla. Mm -hmm. You know, there was two uh, institutions in, built in Australia recently, um, <clears throat> giant batteries. And uh, um, we're also seeing uh, what we like to call a, a retail shopping apocalypse. <laughs> and, uh, you know, these days everything is uh, apocalyptic, you know. But uh, people are buying online, you know. And the sh online shopping, uh, as you've seen, is, you know, ballooning. And uh, these giant retail stores, shopping malls, you know, are, uh, are disappearing. 
see a lot of stores like Sears and Toys R Us. Um, those stores are, are uh, J.C. Penney. Um, retailers aren't seeing the profit there anymore, and their revenues coming in online. So having those kind of venues, uh, stores, isn't profitable anymore. And eventually, um, the stores are all going to move out of those malls. What do we do with those malls? Mm -hmm. Huge, you know, paved areas, um, structure attached to sewer and, ele and, and electricity. Uh, our campaign proposes that we transform these shopping malls into energy stations, where we're looking at either uh, the transmission of energy, the storage, uh, the creation. You know, imagine uh, your local shopping mall covered in solar panels. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we'd have to gut the interiors of these, and, and we don't want anyone to lose their jobs, but uh, they're going to lose their jobs uh, anyway. And if we can bring them back into the green field, uh, we believe green energy companies will be attracted by these already developed areas that they can get for cheap. And hopefully we can, you know, um, uh, promote those ideas. So uh, you mentioned the the retail green energy. Well, Walmart does a lot of that already on their new constructions. They have a lot of solar. They have natural lighting. Um, so I think that that's reasonable. But you mentioned uh, some of the closed down retail centers and shopping malls. Uh, are you thinking the state's going to buy those, or how does the state get involved in that? Well, I think uh, there's zoning issues that the state will be involved in. Um, and certainly, you know, uh, sanitation. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I think we want to bring in uh, companies. Like I mentioned, we want green industries to come in and, uh, you know, uh, take over that, uh, develop their businesses on that land, not state-run uh, utilities, but we want to bring in private investors and help create jobs and, and make up for that workforce that was uh, within the retail market. Okay, so uh, they're giving me the, we got we got to get going symbol. So um, uh, I guess I kind of want to rapid fire these a little bit. Sure. Um, so as a major bullet point, you have uh, recycling, packaging, and waste. One sentence answer. <laughs> we need to move away from plastic. Okay. I don't think anybody can argue with that. I don't know exactly what the state can do, but I think everybody should kind of be there. Uh, Planned Parenthood. Uh, our campaign is is fully in favor of Planned Parenthood. We paying for the state paying to support it. Uh, yes, I think that a lot of uh, groups like Goodwill, Planned Parenthood, um, those okay. are you know we can't have them relying solely on grants. Okay. Uh, we touched on law enforcement in terms of education, uh, but you have law enforcement as a major item here. What are your thoughts on law enforcement? Uh, I think law enforcement needs to be uh, trained in mental health issues. I think uh, bringing um, officers that serve in the community up to speed with uh, certain uh, current issues will help um, help reduce uh, various incidents that happen where if there was an understanding, they may not have happened. Uh, okay, Here, so here's a, a, a softball. I think it should be a softball for everybody at this point, but uh, marijuana is one of your bullet points. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we feel strongly that uh, marijuana should be uh, decriminalized across the board uh, recreationally. Uh, I know recently hemp was uh, brought into the fold, but uh, it's, uh, it's going to be an important source of revenue for the state. It's going to help create jobs, and there's a lot of individuals who truly, you know, uh, need access to that um, for medical reasons. So specifically as governor, what would you do? Regarding marijuana? Mm -hmm. Well, <clears throat> there's a lot of, I've already been contacted a lot on the internet from companies that see that I, we're in favor of that. And I think we can attract uh, business and investment from, uh, from that part of Wisconsin that's going to become part of our agricultural scene. And uh, there's, you know, elements of distribution. Um, there's elements of uh, the whole growth process. Uh, there's, there's lots of different venues for employment and economic growth uh, within, you know, the 
uh, the legalization of, of marijuana. And so uh, states out west are, are struggling with some of this. Um, so what do you do with uh, all of the uh, people who are locked up currently for marijuana infractions? That's a major issue. Uh, <clears throat> I know one of my uh, competitors has said that he would pardon all people that are in jail right now for marijuana offenses. Uh, I'm not uh, going into this with such a blanket phrase, but we need to keep people out of prison for uh, minor drug offenses with marijuana. Uh, that is absolutely uh, something that will end. Um, our prisons are overcrowded, and uh, we're against private prisons, and we want to see the populations in prisons go down. And I think, uh, I think that's a key way to, to do that. So, uh, any closing thoughts? Well, I just want to say that uh, you know, thank you for having me on. It's been a pleasure. Um, but hopefully, uh, we get to have you back on. When when is the election that we're uh, campaigning for? Well, we're looking at uh, we're looking at the election is on November 9th um, for the gubernatorial of this year. Yeah, twenty eighteen. Uh, <laughs> I don't feel like people are talking about it. Well, well, it's still you know it's a a, a broad field, and I think some people. You know, I've been to uh, debates where some people say, ah, there's just too many people running. But then I've been, you know, heard alternately people saying this is wonderful. We have this breadth of personalities to choose from. And I think that's great for Wisconsin. I mean, we have a sign of a healthy democracy here, um, being able to have that many uh, candidates. I'm someone who genuinely cares about the people I'm someone who will bring a new attitude and a new perspective to the state of Wisconsin. And that's where I'm coming from. We need to keep the state beautiful, and we need to stop looking at things that aren't within the lives of the daily people. How do we support real Wisconsinites? How do we survive? This election's about survival. I think that's a good way to place to leave it. Uh, all right, that wraps up our uh, Blind Partisan with Jeff Rumbaugh. Again, if you want to get some more information on Jeff Rumbaugh for governor, go to jeffrumbaughforgovernor.com. Hopefully we can uh, put that online somewhere so that uh, I don't have to spell it out letter for letter. But uh, I, think I think you could find it with a, with a little Googling. Uh, please join us uh, to talk about this episode and others in the Political Radar and Blind Partisan groups on Facebook. Uh, I hang out there quite a bit. Uh, contrary to whatever anybody would want. Uh, and of course, uh, please subscribe on YouTube to the show in the Political Radar channel. Please subscribe on iTunes and anywhere else that you can get uh, podcasts. Goodbye. <laughs>